Let's talk about something that happened a long time ago, but its uh, effects still are going on today. Uh, Nigel Appleby wrote or didn't write a book many years ago, and you and other authors, including my recent guest Andrew Collins, were involved in a lawsuit against him or some kind of dispute. Yeah, a very big dispute. Let's talk about that, because I think it's a story that probably has been forgotten or is to most people, they're completely unaware of it. Yeah, it's so long ago now, isn't it? Yes, I've, I've not really thought about that uh, episode for so long. That really happened at the very beginning of when I started all of this, and I wrote this um, manuscript, which became Thoth, Architect of the Universe. And um, it was pilfered in its manuscript form, because I'd given it to a sort of pseudo-publisher, who was helping me to try and put it into publication. And he passed it across to somebody else, which he shouldn't have done as a publisher, of course. And so this book came out, which was called Hall of the Gods. And um, lo and behold, it had 70 pages out of my book printed verbatim. I, I cannot imagine how this scenario ever happened, because this is a major publisher. This is Random House, Heinemann, Random House biggest publisher in the world. And I had had suspicions that plagiarism was afoot about two months, you know, say about one month before publication, because I'd seen this guy at a conference. So I, I had suspicion that something was not quite right. I wrote to the publisher and I said, look, I think there might be plagiarism in this book. Make sure that there is none in it. And they said, no, of course, there won't be any. So they were pre-warned. In fact, they were doubly pre-warned because I sent them a list of all the extracts that I thought had been pilfered. So I got a letter back saying, no, there is no plagiarism from a major publisher. Then lo and behold, when it came out, it had 70 pages from my book in it. Luckily, by that time, I had actually published my book because I was then in a big hurry to obviously publish, because you can only really guarantee your copyright if you've published first. Within the space of two weeks or something, I had published my book, and I had established the copyright. And so I made this big complaint, and I said to this publisher, you know, what are you doing? I, I forbid you to uh, sell this book, etc. And they had to withdraw it from sale, which was... Absolutely fantastic. I thought this was going to take ages and ages to try and get rid of this book from the shelves, and it happened within one day. <laughs> but what I didn't realize at the time was that another 11 authors had been plagiarized as well. So the whole book was not his creation at all? Absolutely. Everything had been taken from everybody else. I suddenly realized that all these other authors had been complaining about it. And they didn't know anything about my book whatsoever. And so they didn't know where this other complaint came from because the letter came back to all of the other authors. This book has been withdrawn because of a complaint from another source. And they, another source? Who's that? Well, that was, my, <laughs> that was my book, which nobody knew anything about. And as it happens, my book was the main book that actually got it withdrawn from the shelves. Because plagiarism is a funny thing within the legal establishment. You cannot copyright your ideas. So if someone has the same idea or republishes your idea, you have no copyright over it. What you do have copyright over is your diagrams, your drawings, and your form of words. So if someone quotes you verbatim exactly, that's plagiarism. And this guy was so lazy that he hadn't even bothered to rephrase what he had copied. So he just actually copied it verbatim and stuck it straight in his book. So it was not only plagiarism, but because they'd been forewarned, it was flagrant plagiarism, which is the worst kind in the legal sense. And so they didn't really have a foot to stand on. And so they had to withdraw the book. We then had a long drawn out battle because the whole intention 
of this publisher was to put the book back onto the shelves as soon as they could because they put a lot of money into this. You know, they they paid this guy one hundred and fifty thousand pounds as a commission fee before he even started, an advance, which is an enormous sum for a publisher, considering he's never written anything before. How did he manage to do it? You know, if I went to a publisher and said, "Look, I've got an idea," they would put a central finger up. But he went to a publisher and they said, "Yeah, we'll give you one hundred and fifty thousand." What? <laughs> It doesn't like, happen like that. How this guy managed to do it, I really don't know. But he did. So they had put a lot of money into this. They had put this advance in, all of the advertising, all of the money, because they printed 50,000 of these books. And so they wanted to get this book back onto the shelves as soon as possible. So what happened is, is I got all these letters from this very angry lawyer who happened to be the Queen's lawyer. So they had engaged the most expensive lawyer in London to bombard me with threats, saying that they wanted to put this book back on the shelves, which I refused to take. And then they started offering me money. They said, you can have 5% of the book. And I said, up yours. Then they said, I will give you 10%. I said, not interested. We'll give you 15%. No, go away. We'll give you 25%. They got up to 25% that I would get 25% of this book. Which, you know, in terms of the advance, I mean, that's 40,000 pounds. So I told them to get stuffed because the problem was what they wanted to do is put the book back on the shelves, the same book. But everything within that book said that all of the work was his work, not my work. So every time it showed one of my diagrams, because he, he used my diagram straight from my book, it said, I did this and I saw that and I saw Everything I'd written had been rewritten with his name on it. I, I could have taken the 25%, but everything would have then had this other author's name attached to it. So I refused. And then because of this and all of the legal action, because we weren't quite sure what they were going to try and do behind the scenes, Robert Boval came in and he used my solicitor to fight against them to stop them putting this book back on the shelves. And this went on for like two months. And then he said, I'm going down to the publishers to see them. So he went down to the publishers, uh, Random House, to sort this out. And then he came back on a Saturday morning and said, look, Ralph, good news. We've sorted it all out and you've got a publishing contract from Random House. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. Excellent. But you've got to sign this document a peace agreement with the other author it doesn't mean that he can reprint his book but it's a peace agreement so he faxed this peace agreement off to me and it said i the author will never publish this book again with the same jacket cover or the same title ever well that's gonna stop it isn't it you know <laughs> i will never publish it with the same title yeah yeah brilliant that's gonna that's really gonna do it so I said, look, yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, I shall, um, I shall call Random House on Monday. And he said, no, you've got to sign it now. I said, no, if, if they're offering me a contract, I'll go to their offices on Monday if I have to, and I'll have a look at the contract. And of course, I'll probably sign. I mean, everybody wants to sign with Random House, don't they? No, you've got to sign it now. Yeah, but it's Saturday morning. There's, there's no one in Random House. No, you've got to sign it now. If you don't sign it, you'll never work again. Robert Bouval threatened you. He said, you'll, you'll never do anything again. You'll never have a publisher. You'll never do any talk. You'll never do any filming. You'll never do anything. Am I misunderstanding here? Does he work for Random House? No, he wasn't even a Random House author at the time. He worked for the opposition. <laughs> However, what he had done is he had negotiated a contract with Random House to republish the book, co-authoring with the other author and this was supposed to be called what was it i can't remember what it was called now it's in one of my so there was to be a new book out there re-released nigel app be ralph it was ellis to be a new book no 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 new book nigel appleby and robert boval and it was called the secrets of the gods or something i'll look it up on my emails i can't remember what it was called now and, and so he renegotiated this contract and then there was a full page advert came out in Quest magazine 
Robert Beauval and Nigel Appleby, Tour of Egypt. Who wants to come on the Tour of Egypt by these two major authors? And of course, all of that hung on my signing the peace agreement, because if I didn't sign the peace agreement, they couldn't print the book. And I refused. So they couldn't print it. So the whole of that little enterprise went down the tubes. The book was never published. The tour of Egypt never happened. And Mr. Appleby sunk into the West. As a quid pro quo, I, I've not been to any conferences since. Because the prohibition still is still in force by the sounds of it. So you've been blackballed. I've been blackballed by lots of people. Through Robert Baval. I wouldn't say that, um, but somehow, yes, somehow I've been. Well, would you say it's likely between Robert Baval and Random House? Certainly Random House, because Random House, (laughs) I scuppered Random House a little bit. Because of this big argument, because of the copyright claims, they said there was no copyright claim. My solicitor was having trouble, and it's very expensive. If you've ever been through a solicitor, you know how expensive this gets, especially if if their solicitor wants to drag it out. And, of course, their solicitor was the Queen's solicitor. And if you lose the case, you have to pay for their solicitor. So on every letter they sent, they put a little PS on the end. The amount you have to pay now if you lose this case is now £532,000, you know, and rising. That sort of thing, you know, to try and put you off ever taking this to court. But what I discovered as a part of these negotiations is that it was a criminal offence because it was flagrant. And that was the difference. If it's flagrant, it's a criminal offence, which meant I didn't need to use my solicitor. I could use the police. So I went to the police in London and said, look, I've got this case. And they didn't want to take it. They said, we don't do copyright. Go and see copyright people. So I went to see the copyright people and they said, well, we don't take it. It's nothing to do with us. Go and see trading standards. And trading standards said, it's got nothing to do with us. (laughs) So we did this big merry-go-round. And it transpired that somebody had made a law but had not given it to anyone to administer which, of course, you can't do in a nation. So I then took it to Westminster. So we went to the Houses of Parliament to get this law attributed to an authority because there was no one to enforce it. It was heard in the Houses of Parliament and it went to the Attorney General in the Houses of Parliament, my little book, (laughs) which is really brilliant. And finally, the Attorney General gave it to the police and said, look, we have this law. You must look after it. And so it was given to the police. And the police didn't really want to do anything with this. I mean, to them, it's a minor event. They, They don't really want to get involved. But anyway, they were forced to by the attorney general. You can imagine how long this took. Months and months later, the police write to Random House and said, look, we're going to need all the evidence for this case. Can you send us the books and, you know, documentations and things like that? blah de blah de blah they, they weren't really interested. And Random House wrote back and said, piss off. <laughs> Which was not the right response. I, I paraphrase, of course. I'm not sure what they said. But anyway, they certainly told the police that they were not going to get involved. So that got the back of the police up completely of course you don't tell the um, police to go and take a running jump when they ask for evidence so the police got together a posse and a warrant and they went and searched random house (laughs) so they arrived with a force of officers down at random house and, and took all the evidence yes am I persona non grata in random house then yes of course of course, but it was well worth it. It was well worth it. And and you're self-published now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, because some of us are not able to walk down into publishers and, and suddenly get a publishing contract for £150,000. However, as, as a postscript to this, uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2006, I think, something like that. It was after the Gulf War anyway. So 
an SAS major wrote a book about his adventures in the Gulf War. And he got a major publishing contract for this with another publisher, a different publisher. And the week before it was due out, some questions were asked about this major, whether he was actually in the army or not. And the book was taken off the shelves. It was pulped. And then a little postscript came out in the Guardian newspaper saying it would appear that the <laughs> the author involved was one Nigel Appleby. <laughs> no. <laughs> so he'd done it again. He had got another publishing contract on another bogus book with another publisher. I mean, how does he do it? He's cashing in on the retainer and then plagiarizing the material. But how does he do it? How does he work walk into a publisher with a... a a completely fabricated book and persuade them that he's an SAS major when he's never been in the army at all. And he's never been in the SAS, that's for sure. And, and, and persuade them that he has been in Iraq and had all these adventures and he's writing this book about it. So where is Nigel Appleby now? Oh, I, I don't know. I've got no idea what he, what he is doing now. He, he used to do, um, Military art. I'm not He's sure. He's going to say selling forgeries. <laughs> he probably is. <laughs> Who knows? But it was just funny that, you know, he's the only author to have had two books pulped before they, you know, were even on sale, as it were. Where can the audience pick up your books, Ralph? I'm assuming from your website and uh, there's other places. Yeah. So Edfu Books website, Edfu hyphen books website. The only paper books now are really in Adventures Unlimited. So if you go on to the Adventures Unlimited of Illinois, Kempton, Illinois, David Hatcher Childress does all of our books in, in paper form. So get on to them and have a look. But otherwise, we're all electronic now, mainly because we can update books much more quickly in electronic form. And I've been going through pretty much all of the books now, and, and making new editions. So if you go on to the um, Kindle or Apple, uh, or even Nook now as well, which is the Barnes & Noble one. Ralph Bellis, thank you once again for being on the program. Very good talking to you again. It's always a pleasure.